The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Good evening. My name is Jamie Bender, and I am the Assistant Director for, Cro for Programs for the Center for International Studies here at the University of Chicago. Tonight, we are pleased to welcome Professor David Sheffer for the first The World Beyond the Headlines lecture of winter quarter. The World Beyond the Headlines series is a project of the Center for International Studies, and we hope you will join us for the next The World Beyond the Headlines event on January 25th, when we will welcome Austrian Consul General Thomas Schnoll, who will be discussing the future of the Eurozone, the European project at a crossroads. That talk will be held at 6 p.m. at the Knapp Center for Biomedical Discovery. More information on that talk and other upcoming CIS events can be found on the CIS website, and to be kept current on all of our future events, you can sign up to receive updates via email or by following us on Twitter or liking us on Facebook. Tonight's The World Beyond the Headlines event is presented in collaboration with the Seminary Co-op Bookstore and co-sponsored with the Human Rights Program and the University of Chicago Human Rights Law Society. Thank you to all of our co-sponsors for their support of this program and especially to the Human Rights Program, which has been part of the series for many, many years. The lecture this evening is being video recorded and will be available for download on the CIS website as well as on the University of Chicago multimedia source, piasmos.uchicago.edu, and that website is printed on the back of the bookmarks that you received when you arrived. Um, following this evening's talk, there will be a book signing and a light reception just outside this room. It is now my pleasure to ask Susan Zesch. Um, the director of the University of Chicago Human Rights Program to introduce tonight's speaker. Good evening. Uh, before I introduce tonight's speaker to you, I'd like to introduce you to Professor Sheffer, Ambassador Sheffer. Um, just to help him know who's here, how many people here are law students? Raise your hands. Okay. How many people here are students from the college? How many people here are students from other divisions of the university? How many are neighbors, friends, faculty, staff? guests. All right. Thank you very much. Um, it is a tremendous honor to welcome Ambassador David Sheffer <coughs> to the University of Chicago. He is the Mayor Brown Robert Hellman Professor of Law at Northwestern University and Director of the Center for International Human Rights at Northwestern University Law School. We are very pleased to welcome him to present his book about a remarkable career during a remarkable time in U.S. history. David Sheffer was an ambassador appointed by President Bill Clinton to be the ambassador at large for war crimes. But when I read through parts of the book today, and I have to admit I haven't read all of it, but the stuff I've read is so gripping that I will read all of it, and I commend the book to all of you, um, <clears throat> it became apparent that he was an ambassador in more than one sense. He was an ambassador in his official capacity as a diplomat to other countries, to multilateral meetings, to the United Nations, representing the interests of the U.S. State Department. But in addition to that, I believe that Ambassador Sheffer also saw himself as an ambassador for victims of atrocities, people whose lives had been robbed, who had been tortured and killed under the most atrocious of circumstances. He became, in the course of his work, their ambassador representing the souls of victims of atrocities in the corridors of power. So the title ambassador that he now gets to have for the rest of his career is based on a period of time in which he performed a very remarkable function. The construction of the mechanisms of justice, of international justice, based on the Nuremberg legacy was a project that the United States really didn't take seriously until the Clinton administration. And the story and the arc of the story in Ambassador Sheffer's book is something that is a historically important period for all of us to understand. How the establishment of ad hoc mechanisms to deal with atrocities and war crimes in various parts of the world ultimately led to the creation of the International Criminal Court. Ambassador Sheffer's uh, vision and purpose and drive and ambition to finally get the U.S. to sign the treaty, create the Rome Treaty, creating the International Criminal Court. And what happens after under the Bush administration is what you need to buy the book and read about. Um, it's a story that we hope is not a story with an end, but a story that where the um, institutions that were created during this period of the 90s 
uh, that have become um, institutionalized in the international court are something that can carry on with a transnational, international support for justice for people who suffer some of the worst things that is possible for one human being to do to another. I'm not going to talk any more about the book or about Professor Sheffer. We're very pleased that he's here at the other law school in the city of Chicago visiting us from uh, their uh, building up there on Lakeshore Drive. And I hope that you have a lot of interesting questions for him afterwards. And uh, I look forward to hearing what he has to say and what you have to say. So thank you very much. And welcome, David. Thank you. Well, thank you, Susan, very, very much. And um, uh, for the, is it Alice who, or, or Jamie? I'm sorry, Jamie, who, who uh, started this whole thing and who was so responsible for uh, helping organize this. Um, it's a tremendous pleasure for me to be here because uh, I've spoken at the University of Chicago Law School many times over the years. At least, at least once a year, I come over and deliver a lecture of some sort. Um, and I always get to meet a new group of students, uh, and they're always very enjoyable to meet. I am very proud to tell you. Um, and I want to just ask this one question. Is anyone here taking, uh, at the law school, trust in estates law this year? Oh, shoot. Okay. Uh, because my wife teaches it here. <laughs> Her name is Michelle Hunky, and she teaches T&E law. Uh, she's a partner with a law firm downtown and comes over here twice a week. She'll be here early tomorrow morning teach, teaching T&E law to whoever takes it here. Uh, but um, so I have a special affinity with the University of Chicago Law School. Part of the family is part of it. And I'm very, very proud of it. We also have faculty members who are graduates of it. And, and I interact with UC people all the time. So. Um, uh, I don't have this sense of rivalry, by the way, with UC. I, I, I really don't. I mean, it's collaboration. And, and quite frankly, I'm married to a UC professor, so I have to get along. Um, all right, let me tell you about this book. I'm going to make some remarks about the book. It'll take about 15 minutes. And then I'd actually like to read a few short extracts from the book uh, to you uh, to see if you might uh, enjoy listening to some of those extracts. Um, and then uh, just open it up for questions and answers, because that's always very, very much the most interesting part of any one of these uh, sessions. I wrote All the Missing Souls over a three-year period, from 2007 through mid-2010 uh, at Northwestern Law. And that included a final five-month period awaiting clearance by the federal government, given the great deal of classified information I worked with as a diplomat, it had to go through six levels of clearance in the federal government before it could be released for publication. Um, I wanted to wait to write this memoir, uh, which I prefer to call a personal history, because there is so much history in this book. I wanted the dust to settle, so I would be an honest and self-critical writer. I actually dislike these instant memoirs these days. I used to read them, I don't read them anymore. If someone comes out with a book about within a year of leaving a job, I don't think it's worth reading. It's always gonna be very defensive. And when I started writing right after I left office in 2001, I was writing very defensively. And it looked so awful, I just put it aside, pursued my career, and said I'll come back to this years later. And I am so grateful that I did that to myself because by the time I sat down in 2007 to write, I was very prepared to be self-critical. I, I had the perspective of knowing where I had, had, had mistakenly pursued policy and, and, made flaw, and had flaws in my own performance. And by then, I was, extreme, I was very prepared to talk about it. Um, and that is why I'm so happy that this book is coming out now, years later, as opposed to right after uh, leaving office. One of my heroes, is Telford Taylor, you know, of the Nuremberg trials, our uh, uh, U.S. prosecutor there. And um, uh, I have always uh, admired the fact that his book on the anatomy of the Nuremberg trials was published in 1992, uh, many decades after Nuremberg. He took the time sitting at Columbia Law to actually get it right. Um, and it's a masterpiece. And I, I, I didn't wait decades, but I waited a decade to to try to put my thoughts down, or at least most of a decade. Um, 
I realized from the beginning that there are many ways to approach the issue of evil, and there are many books that tackle that challenge. How do these men, and sometimes women, embrace evil and decimate vast numbers of human beings? My book is not designed to answer that question, in part because I think the answers are so complex and varied from one atrocity situation to another that singular formulas are folly. I am reminded, however, of the view of Prosecutor Luis Moreno Ocampo of the International Criminal Court when he observes that leaders who commit atrocity crimes keep doing so to maintain their power. My book is about discovering the right formula in an international setting to confront evil in the courtroom. Consider the challenge that confronted us. Mass atrocities, leadership perpetrators, an ongoing conflict usually, or at least a potentially resurgent one, a destroyed or failed court system domestically with no functioning or credible court that actually has jurisdiction, unwilling political leaders, skeptical, a skeptical international community much more focused on the conflict itself. That was the scenario facing us in the Balkans, in Rwanda, and in Sierra Leone. Cambodia was different only in that the atrocities had long ended, but the infrastructure was lacking and political landmines were all over the place in Cambodia. We were not starting from scratch because we had Nuremberg and Tokyo as precedents, but ours was a very different challenge under far more complex circumstances. This would not be Victor's justice. Modern international justice is no simple code of procedure either. The quest for justice meanders back and forth between international and domestic courts. The search for evil aimed for the courtroom and in the resolve that removing war criminals from politics and military leadership would make a difference. We have witnessed a transformational era in confronting atrocity crimes, which I will I define in this book, and that includes genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. The last 20 years have been nothing but revolutionary in how the world responds to these atrocity crimes. I do not mean to say we have learned how to effectively confront atrocities in, or the threat of them, and my book describes our failures in Rwanda, Bosnia, and Sierra Leone. But I do believe we have learned from those failures in our actions in Kosovo in 1999, described in the book, and more recently in Libya, point to a new understanding about the value of military intervention or other measures under the responsibility to protect principle. We also need to recognize, however, that in our lifetimes, where so many transformational events have radically altered our lives and our societies, the collapse of the Soviet Empire, the end of the Cold War, the rise of the internet, cell phones, iPads, Twitter, radically modernized media market, the Arab Spring, Amazon, and unimagined economic calamities, there also was a transformation of international and national justice for war crimes. What happened? Well, first, let's understand what the old world was, the pre-1993 world. Douglas Gillian, in Time magazine, when he reviewed my book, I thought said it rather succinctly, uh, uh, and I'll just quote him. In the six decades following World War II, no fewer than 313 international and internal conflicts have erupted, killing up to 101 million people by one estimate. Many were victims of crimes against humanity, but most of the perpetrators have managed to go scot-free. In the post-war period, according to a recent study published by legal scholar Sharif Passiuni at DePaul, just 823 people were indicted for violations of international humanitarian law, even though the ratio of civilian to military fatalities was staggeringly high, perhaps 9,000 to 1." Close quote. So at first glance, that record does not look so impressive uh, after World War II. It's true, we had no international courts after Nuremberg and Tokyo. Uh, that was our one big experiment with international criminal tribunals and it was not repeated for many decades. We also uh, honored official impunity for leaders uh, and international law was right there standing shoulder to shoulder with the principle of impunity through uh, uh, diplomatic immunities and head of state immunities, etc. No one was prosecuted. Pol Pot, Stalin, Idi Amin, Papa Doc Duvalier, uh, Ceausescu, Mengistu, uh, Sukarno, Suharto, uh, the leaders of apartheid, uh, none of those individuals were actually uh, prosecuted. 
The communist world knew no true commitment to the rule of law and the free world exercised it with great discretion. We also poorly understood what atrocity crimes really meant. What did we really know about genocide, about crimes against humanity, and about war crimes during this long period after World War II? We had the records of Nuremberg and Tokyo, but very little else. Crimes against humanity were tied to arms conflicts. Genocide was tied to the Holocaust and the Genocide Convention, which had never been enforced. War crimes were tied to the Geneva Conventions and yet were rarely the object of court martials and never since Nuremberg prosecuted internationally. We had a weak national enforcement system. Few states had incorporated atrocity crimes into their domestic criminal codes. And we had really no experienced international jurists, no body of jurists to draw upon who understood international criminal law and international humanitarian law. The judges of the International Court of Justice were in a different field of international law. What is the world after 1993? What has transpired? Well, obviously the Soviet empire is gone as well as its anti-legal ideology, although the pull of authoritarianism remains a grave threat to the rule of law and democracy in such countries as Hungary today. Uh, but let's recognize what's going on in Burma, Myanmar, um, the Arab uprisings, the large number of post-Soviet states supporting the International Criminal Court. The new world is radically different. We also have a lot of international courts now. The International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, the UN Courts in East Timor, the War Crimes Chamber in Sarajevo, and uh, UN Courts in Kosovo. Uh, and we're talking about uh, particular ad hoc tribunals in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka these days. We also have what I would argue is the emergence of a trend to end actual impunity. Leaders have been prosecuted. Slobodan Milosevic, Jan Kambanda of uh, Rwanda, Charles Taylor of Liberia. The top surviving Khmer Rouge leaders are now on trial in Phnom Penh. Radovan Karadzic and Ratko Mladic are on trial in uh, The Hague. Muammar Gaddafi, you know his story. Uh, Omar al-Bashir of Sudan is under indictment now by the International Criminal Court. So that issue of can you actually sustain impunity indefinitely among leadership uh, uh, categories uh, in various uh, countries, I think that is under severe challenge. I think it is becoming more the norm that uh, uh, we are seeing the end of impunity as opposed to uh, that being a, a very unconventional theory which it was 20 years ago. We also have developed great sophistication with respect to atrocity crimes. There's an enormous amount of jurisprudence and practice that, that elucidates what these crimes now mean. The more we understand them, the more our courts will be enabled to prosecute them. For example, we've learned so much more about rape as genocide, about what it means to aid and abet genocide, we know much more about gravity requirements for these crimes, about command responsibility, about specific intent and inferred intent, about new crimes against humanity like forced marriage, forced pregnancy, about uh, the significance of the crime of, of apartheid, what it really means to say that there's a crime of persecution and how that relates to ethnic cleansing, and various forms of sexual violence, as well as we actually learned a tremendous amount in the tribunals about the crime of torture. The only question is whether or not those lessons made it, it made it across the Atlantic to the United States during the last decade. There's a sophisticated body of law that has arisen, and that is what I describe as atrocity law in the book, which is the law applied by and developed further by the war crimes tribunals. They are an intersection of international criminal law, international humanitarian law, international human rights law, and the law of war. Any study of the tribunals and the law they are using has to recognize that these tribunals are developing a rather unique form of law, and I believe it should be described as such in the future. We also see stronger national enforcement. Look at what has transpired in Bosnia with the war crimes chamber there, in the war crimes courts of Serbia and Croatia, in Rwanda, uh, even in Cambodia with the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia which is a Cambodian court, it's not an international court. Uh, and the tens of countries that have upgraded their criminal codes as part of implementing the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. 
Even in the United States, there is a beginning. We're not a state party to the uh, International Criminal Court, but look at the text of the uh, recent legislation spearheaded by Senator Durbin uh, and now law, the Genocide Accountability Act, the Child Soldiers Accountability Act, the Human Trafficking Accountability Act. Those are all acts that uh, uh, bring into our domestic criminal code the kind of capacity that we need domestically to actually prosecute many of these crimes. There's also the Crimes Against Humanity Accountability Act, which is not yet law, is, is foundering in Congress, but I would argue is an, is an absolutely essential law to bring us up to speed and modernize uh, our federal code, our federal criminal code. We also have experienced jurists now. There's a whole cadre of jurists today who are well-trained in international criminal law, or what I would call atrocity law for the tribunals. We have prosecutors, a whole new international defense bar, and administrators well-trained in court management. There's that whole bureaucracy that didn't exist 20 years ago, and now uh, we have extremely expert individuals who are well-trained and well-knowledgeable in these fields of law. And finally, the influence on international politics. It used to be that we always talked about how and to what extent the Security Council would actually influence international justice. And I think now you can turn that argument around and say, to what extent is international justice actually influencing the work of the Security Council and of politicians internationally? Uh, it's no longer live and forget, it's live and remember. And uh, I think those themes are just permeating throughout the international community. Now, the building of institutions of international justice has had a lot to do with that new reality, namely that impunity is on the losing side of history. My book, All Missing Souls, is the story of this transformational moment in history about the creation and rise of five war crimes tribunals during the 1990s. The Yugoslav and Rwanda tribunals, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the Cambodia Tribunal, and the Permanent International Criminal Court. That task of building five courts occupied all eight years of the Clinton administration. For me. I was, as, as one colleague once described me uh, to an entire crowd, he introduced me as the ambassador to hell, um, uh, and I was. But also I was the ambassador to hell and back. I like to think of myself in my more optimistic moments, without thinking of all of my mistakes, as the carpenter of war crimes tribunals. This was a frontal assault on impunity, often amidst ongoing atrocities. The book is an insider's account. I tried to write what has not been covered in other books and to provide that inside information. It comes from boxes and boxes of my personal notebooks. I took zillions of notes every day, um, and I have them. And this book is drawn from that original source, that eyewitness source every single day. Four years, the first term of the Clinton administration, I was senior advisor and counsel to Ambassador Madeleine Albright at the UN and I was involved in all of the foreign policy work that our ambassador to the UN gets involved with, but I was also her deputy on the deputies committee at the White House, and that is a committee that takes all foreign policy issues and considers them for ultimate decision by the president. And so for four years, if you want to blame whatever happened in the Clinton administration on its watch in foreign policy for the first four years, um, I'll have to accept responsibility because I was there, I was at the table. Uh, that's where we made the decisions uh, repeatedly every week, two or three meetings a week at least uh, in the Deputies Committee. Um, but with Albright's support, uh, and she was truly a, a leader on accountability for atrocity crimes, I was able to press ahead, often against almost impossible resistance, from the Pentagon, from Congress, from foreign allies and foes, from the United Nations itself, and from the intelligence community. I also describe in the book those moments when Albright and I had our disagreements, and I know those passages have attracted some interest, but I, I hope they're outweighed by the enormous respect that I, I have for Madeleine Albright and, and the, the vast content of this book, which frankly uh, brings to you the real story, uh, at least from my perspective, of, of how pioneer uh, was at Madeleine Albright in forging the foreign policy of this nation. Um, there's also a lot in the book about the United Nations, about our fellow permanent members on the Security Council, about our European allies. There are insights on Sandy Berger, Richard Holbrook, George Tennant, etc. 
Now, let me just close my remarks before reading a few passages by, uh, since this is kind of an academic audience, uh, I have my little academic part here. Um, and I just want to say, you know, there are some major themes in this book, which if you read through it as, as an academic, as a student, I hope these are sort of some of the themes that start to, to come out of this book at you. The first is the incredible difficulties that emerge in actually creating and starting each one of these war crimes tribunals. There is no cookie cutter means of doing this in any region of the world, in any ad hoc situation. It's always going to be a different set of circumstances, a different set of political pressures, uh, and frankly, different law often, a particularly domestic law that you have to weave into the international law that you're building into the tribunal. And all of that uh, takes an enormous amount of negotiation and understanding of the domestic and international political context in which you're working. Uh, the Yugoslav Tribunal took four months to create, uh, literally, I mean, just to, to start and then have the Security Council resolution that creates it. Uh, the Rwanda Tribunal took five months. The Special Court for Sierra Leone took nine months to negotiate, but then an extra year to finalize while money was being found to pay for it. The extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia took about 4.5 years to negotiate, and then uh, several additional years to actually finalize the final package so that it could be up and running in 2007. And then the International Criminal Court took six years, 1995 through 2000, to negotiate. Uh, that includes all its major supplemental documents. Uh, and two more uh, before, uh, with additional negotiations on additional documents until it was actually uh, up and running on July 1st of 2002. You could stretch that by an additional two years if you include the 1993 and 94 sessions of the International Law Commission where they first took a look at building a statute for the court. And then we got involved as governments in direct governmental negotiations in 1995 at the UN. And I had the, the privilege of being there from the very beginning in 1993 with the ILC and all the way through to the final day of the Clinton administration on January 20 of 2001. The second major theme uh, is the timidity of governments. Their timidity to first intervene to stop atrocities in real time. And this deeply influenced the rise of the tribunals, of course. There's a chapter on Rwanda in the book entitled It's Genocide Stupid that just talks about what did we get wrong in 1994 and how did that happen in Washington day by day? What happened within those meetings in Washington? Because I was, I was there, I was part of it. Uh, there's a chapter about Srebrenica in 1995. What happened in Washington during those, though, that episode in 1995? How did it come to pass that 8,000 uh, Bosniaks, uh, uh, men and, and boys, were slaughtered uh, north of Srebrenica in July of 1995, and why did that happen? Uh, what could have, what, what was transpiring back in Washington uh, and elsewhere at that time? And then there's a chapter on Kosovo, chapter 10, crime scene Kosovo, where we really did try to take the lessons we had learned from Rwanda and Srebrenica and actually apply them. And I think we did apply them in Kosovo. And the chapter is, is a story about that episode, for me, it was, um, it was, it was uh, an extraordinary experience because I was actually able, to, by that date in 1999, the war crimes ambassador was able to step forward and really be at the forefront of policy making and policy projection of the US government because atrocities were being committed and we needed to take a stand on those atrocities. And the chapter describes that and also the willingness of my bosses, Albright, and then there was Bill Cohen over the Defense Department, of course, President Clinton, Sandy Berger at the National Security Council, George Tenet at the CIA, all allowing me and actually asking me to step forward and be the point man. Um, and uh, that, I think, demonstrated that some lessons had been learned. Um, there is uh, the timidity of governments to fully resource the tribunals, and that's a story that I tell in the story and the book about where do we find the money to pay for these? And then there's the timidity of governments to capture war criminals like Radovan Karadzic and Ratko Mladic. There's a chapter in the book, chapter six, Unbearable Timidity, where I talk about the five-year hunt for Karadzic and Mladic. 
and one mistake after another that was made in that pursuit. Of course, we didn't catch them, did we? They weren't brought into custody until many years later, uh, and of course now they do stand trial. Um, let's see, I'm going to say just uh, two more words here. Uh, there's a discussion in the book about the failure of Washington to embrace the International Criminal Court, the Rome Statute in 1998. Of course, I was in the center of all of that. But then two years later, we made the decision we would sign the Rome Statute. And the book tells that story of arriving at that moment of signing the statute and how we got there after Rome. Um, there's pages uh, where I describe my own missteps, pages 412 through 414 as a summary of them. So you, you, get, the, you get the checklist. Um, and uh, there's also a raw view, though, of the atrocities themselves in Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Bosnia, and Kosovo. Those, I witnessed these atrocities and the immediate aftermath of them. And so I try to provide a little bit of that perspective in the book. Um, and then finally, I do it, try to introduce in the final chapter, it's a postscript chapter, what it means to say atrocity crimes, what it means to say atrocity law. Uh, and I think that's particularly helpful uh, for the academic community. There's a chart at the back of the book that compares all the tribunals and their various areas of jurisdiction, et cetera, which I think is helpful. Now, if I may, let me um, uh, read a couple of things to you, um, which I hope uh, will be, I, I actually want to take one of the more you know, humorous passages, if I may start with that. Uh, this can be a dark issue, uh, but I've tried to write this in a narrative that is engaging and that brings some of the real life and human folly and humor uh, into this story as well. Um, I worked for Madeleine Albright for eight years. And Madeleine Albright displayed great cunning in her public service, and she brilliantly mastered both the Washington bureaucracy and the UN behemoth in New York. I marveled at how she could coax the most obstinate opponent into conceding vital points while pitching over the cliff those who dared to presume that she, a woman in a man's world of diplomacy, had a weak spine. Some of my most enjoyable moments were when I played a bit part in her theater of misperceptions. During my early years with Albright, I would witness a group of men, and typically only men, enter her office at the State Department in Washington. She, she had her office in, in the State Department as well, of course, at the UN, uh, at the mission, and she spent a good amount of time in Washington as a cabinet member and a policymaker in the, in the Clinton administration. So she, these men would plop down on comfortable couches for a policy meeting with her, while I sat on one of the hardback chairs to take notes and occasionally contribute a few words. Ambassador Albright would rise from her desk, greet the gentlemen, and ask if they wanted coffee. Invariably, some of the men would say, yes, please, and expect Albright to sit down with them and have either her secretary or me serve the coffee. But Albright strode over to a side table, slowly poured the coffee, and brought each cup, one at a time, to the anointed men. Our first test was to see whether anyone objected to the US permanent representative to the United Nations personally serving him coffee. Sometimes the men simply thanked her. The second test was to wait for one of the kind men to object and offer to help carry the coffee cups. But she would stop the poor soul and say cheerfully to the entire group, oh, please don't bother. You know, I used to do this for a living when I was a housewife. From that moment forward, Madeleine Albright controlled the meeting as the men sunk a bit lower in those soft couches. Um, now I want to read uh, something from the Rwandan genocide. Um, now we're going to be a little more serious. and I've got three patch passages to read. This is the second one. Um, and I think what I want to read here is this. The United States failed in 1994 to respond effectively to the genocide that engulfed Rwanda. 
The reasons did not originate only with the brutal killings of 18 American soldiers on the streets of Mogadishu, Somalia, six months earlier. To be sure, that firefight had an enormously negative impact for years thereafter on Washington's attitude about military engagements in Africa or with anyone labeled UN, and it shaped the context for failing to intervene to end Rwanda's genocide. But Mogadishu was a distant stream that penetrated the subconscious thinking of policymakers. The real struggle took place over more contemporary issues that required immediate decisions for effective action, but instead triggered a multitude of excuses and devastating delays. For those of us in the policy rooms at the time, the memory of our vacillation over the horror is sickening and will never be extinguished. I owe the victims and their families my soul every day. During the Rwandan genocide, policymakers, including American, European, and UN officials, equivocated and made decisions with tragic consequences. The National Security Council failed to convene the deputies and principals committees soon enough. They could have focused urgent attention on the genocide and sparked bold decision making and interagency coordination. While the Pentagon tied itself in knots reviewing performance criteria for peacekeeping operations, the State Department remained faithful to a failed peace process that was buried beneath the bodies stacking up throughout the countryside of Rwanda. We did not act quickly enough after the killing began. We should have, well, this was at Madeleine Albright speaking. We should not have allowed the refugee camps to become safe havens for the killers. We did not Im immediately call these crimes by their rightful name, genocide. And we prepared that, I mean, we worked on that, but it wasn't stated until 1997. These words were very late in coming, but they had to be said for the sake of American credibility. And in fact, they preceded by years the admissions and apologies of other key governments, such as France and Belgium. What happened? The United States responded conventionally to an extraordinarily unconventional crisis and thus lost opportunities to reverse the tide of killings at the earliest stages. And then I go on to talk about that at great length. Um, I want to turn now to the International Criminal Court. And this is just before I depart for Rome in June of 1998 to negotiate the final stages of the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court, which was to be concluded in July of 1998, and thus began the process of actually building the court. Um, I, Ambassador Albright, I mean, Secretary of State Albright and I at that point were trying to change US policy so that we could go to Rome with a new position and, and hopefully prevail with that position uh, to protect our interests, but also advance to the creation of the International Criminal Court. I had to fight that battle internally within the US bureaucracy. One step in that process, a very important one, was to meet with the president prior to the negotiations and frankly try to persuade him to buy into our policy, our, our proposal. The president was otherwise occupied. He was preparing for a trip to, trip to China and it was also the Monica Lewinsky summer. So I was told tactfully by his chief of staff uh, that they would allow me to meet with the First Lady, Hillary Clinton, who perhaps would have an opportunity to convey my message to the President. Um, so I said, fine, I'll come over and, and obviously I'll, I'll talk with the First Lady about this. So on that day in early June 1998, Hillary entered with Milan Verbeer, her Chief of Staff. Eric Schwartz and Jamie Baker of the National Security Council uh, deputy lawyers of theirs and I took our assigned seats on the couch and assorted chairs of the map room in the White House. Hillary appeared tired and drawn as if she had been through some kind of hell and back. I worried what that might mean for the fate of our discussion, but I plunged ahead explaining precisely what Albright had set forth in the late May teleconference as the shift we needed in the U.S. negotiating position. Baker, the lawyer from the NSC, then weighed in with the Pentagon's view to hold firm on the long-standing American requirements. Hillary asked how the negotiations had gotten so convoluted with such complexities over jurisdiction. 
Why not, she asked, just have a global war crimes tribunal modeled on the Yugoslav tribunal, which was created by the Security Council? When this all got started, she thought we would simply reproduce the Yugoslav tribunal on a world stage. I explained why the International Criminal Court would be a treaty-based court independent of the United Nations, and that after years of negotiations, the situation had changed as governments expressed their largely negative views about the Security Council controlling a judicial process. Hillary expressed her amazement that the French did not find the International Criminal Court abhorrent, given that the country's involvement in Africa and the exposure of their forces there. I explained that France was one of the most engaged governments in the negotiations and saw this as a means to lead in Europe and in the realm of international justice. I also knew they were likely to sign the Rome Statute, perhaps even at the conclusion of the diplomatic conference. She absorbed without flinching Baker's condescending warning that since the president finally understood the role of the military, if he were to support the Pentagon position, President Clinton would earn the military's permanent respect and allegiance, which I thought was due on inauguration day in 1993. And that meant he needed to back the current U.S. insistence on full immunity from prosecution by the court as both a non-party state and as a possible future state party to the court. In rebuttal, I reminded her of the futility of trying to attain full immunity that would extend even to our status as a state party and that it was undercutting our credibility to achieve major objectives in the treaty. Hillary paused to reflect thanked us, and told me she sympathized with how difficult my job would be in Rome. I saw that as a signal that she would advise the president to back the Pentagon's futile position. And that is exactly what he did. So those are some passages. I could read a, a few more, but I think we should really open it up for uh, questions. Uh, and uh, I will. I can take questions on, on any subject that uh, you want to throw at me here. I'll see if I can handle it. Um, but uh, I am open for business. Yes? Where are we now in terms of the United States in the party to Well, it's, uh, it's a very interesting question. Where are we now in terms of being a party? We are a, a signed party to the court. However, there was a, a development in the Bush administration whereby a letter was sent in May of 2002 by John Bolton to the United Nations stating that the United States no longer recognizes itself as a signatory nation to the court. In other words, we don't have any of the obligations of a signatory state anymore. The reason that's important was because the Bush administration wanted to adopt the American Service Members Protection Act, which is a direct assault against the court, and you cannot, as a signatory state, act to undermine a treaty. You're not ratified yet, but you, you don't sit there and try to destroy the very treaty you're a signatory to. So they thought that they had sort of removed, uh, and it's my signature on the treaty. So uh, there's this letter now. If, you, if you're at, at the UN and you look at the records, there's a little asterisk next to the United States of America, and you go down to the asterisk, and it's the text of John Bolton's letter. Okay? All President Obama has to do to resurrect the signature is send another letter that revokes the Bolton letter, and then there'll be an asterisk reflecting Bolton's letter, and then two asterisks reflecting President Obama's letter. Um, that hasn't happened yet, but even if, it doesn't really matter because even if the argument is we're not a signatory state anymore, you can accede to the treaty easily as a non-signatory. The real question is, why aren't we there yet? Um, let me just try to put the positive spin on this for a moment. The reality is, uh, is that even from the latter years of the Bush administration and into the Obama administration now, the United States has increasingly taken cooperative steps with the International Criminal Court. We actually have a very robust relationship as a government with this court now. Um, we are doing things that are of great assistance to the court. Why? Because the court's actions in its investigations and prosecutions, uh, particularly in these atrocity situations in Africa, are actually accord with U.S. interests. 
So it's not as if we're doing something that someone would argue, oh, that's against U.S. interests to be assisting the court in that manner to facilitate that objective. No, actually, those objectives are U.S. objectives also. So there's a synergy here which is developing, and it started in 2005 with the Security Council referral of Darfur to the court, which the United States abstained on. John Bolton was in the seat at the time, and there was simply no logical basis for him to vote against that resolution, that referral. Uh, even all the evangelical groups would have, would have responded extremely negatively if he had, because the evangelical groups wanted Darfur on the deck of the ICC. So there were interests involved. In Libya, uh, last year, the United States actually took the lead at the Security Council to refer Libya to the International Criminal Court. Um, so in our position in the Security Council, we can do a lot. Uh, in October, the United States sent 100 military advisors to Uganda for the express purpose of tracking down and bringing to The Hague Joseph Kony and three other indictees of the Lord's Resistance Army. Those are ICC indictees. We have 100 military personnel in the field right now to achieve that objective in Uganda, working, of course, with the Ugandan military. So you can see that in many different ways, and I've only scratched the, the, the ways in which we're cooperating these days, there is quite a developing relationship. And I think, you know, it's interesting, intellectually, you can go a great distance with this. Because you could actually construct an argument that it's more beneficial to the International Criminal Court for us to be a non-party but providing all of this outside facilitating assistance uh, than if we were a state party with what might be considered some of the baggage of being a state party, um, including the financial burden of being a state party, because we'd have to pay the largest share of the cost of the ICC if we were a state party. Right now it's Japan, they're a state party, and of course because of the size of their economy, they pay the largest share of the, uh, of the uh, 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 annual uh, cost of the court. Um, but you could make an argument that in many different ways the United States actually is facilitating more of the work of the court by being outside of it than by being inside. Of course, I, I certainly hope that ultimately over the years we can gravitate towards uh, membership. We do lose the leadership in international justice by being outside of the ICC. You, simply, you, know, you could intellectually try to make the argument that of course we're at the head of international justice. Look at our great domestic legal system. Look what we do to try to bring terrorists to, to justice. Hmm. Um, uh, you know, look at all of the things we're doing. Well, no, not actually. Most of the world looks at us and they say, God, you know, God, guess what, you're not part of the International Criminal Court. You're not taking on the burden of responsibility for deciding how international justice will be administered. So guess what, you're actually not the leader anymore. Um, and our voice is far more diminished now on that world scene than it was during the 1990s. So that's a, that's a serious problem. Anyone want to ask about Syria or, or yes? yes you want to ask about Syria? Great. Go for uh, it. Why does the U.S. take a different stand in Syria than in Libya? Ah. You know, in Syria, um, she asked, why does the U.S. take a different stand than in Libya? Well, actually, um, uh, you know, if you look at what the United States has been trying to do in the Security Council with respect to Syria, it's actually taken the lead with certain of our European allies to uh, uh, implement the toughest possible measures against Libya in terms of sanctions, et cetera. Russia has been pulling us back, has not permitted those resolutions to go through in the Security Council. So you do have a sort of gridlock situation in the Security Council where we can't move forward in that respect. I think there is actually, uh, and I'm just saying this subjectively, I'm not here to defend the U.S. government, uh, uh, I'm not a government official. Um, I think you do have to objectively look at the total picture of Syria. There'd have to be a calculation if the Security Council were to refer Syria to the ICC by, uh, the, the, under the referral authority of the Rome Statute for the Security Council. That's under Enforcement Authority, Chapter 7 in the US UN Charter. Syria technically would be obligated to completely cooperate with the security, with the ICC and its investigations of, 
of, of, of Assad, Bashar Assad, et cetera. Um, if, if they were to go down that path, I think some people are saying there's a risk that there would be a lot of pressure, particularly by Russia, if Russia were to agree to such a vote, or by China, that the whole issue of the Israeli occupation of the Golan Heights would also have to be on deck, you know, before the ICC. And that whole relationship between Syria and Israel might become enmeshed in that referral. Now, you can structure a Security Council referral to completely avoid that issue. It just has to be specific. You know, the crimes of or the actions of the Syrian government against the civilian population in the year 2011 onwards. And that would not include the Golan Heights. But I think there is a little bit of fear there that it could get twisted a bit. And so that's, that's just pragmatically speaking, I think there's a little bit of, of pullback that's different from Libya. On Libya, we actually had Russia and China with us uh, on, on that referral in February. Um, so it was an easier calculation, and Libya was not nearly the same ally to Russia as Syria is. So there's a real political problem there. Uh, but I think if, if we didn't have the Russian and Chinese issue within the Security Council, I can imagine structuring a U.S. policy that could move towards a Security Council referral of Syria to the ICC, um, but it would have to be a very, very carefully worded referral. That, that establishes what the jurisdiction of the court will be over what nature, what subject matter jurisdiction for that referral would be before the court. Any others? Yes? Uh, first of all, thank you for coming and for talking. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you see for the future of international law, given everything that's happened in the past 20 years. What do you see 20 years from now? The question is, what do I see for the future of international law, which of course is a huge area as opposed to just the, the atrocity law or the international criminal law that is the focus of this study. Um, that's an interesting one. My goodness, I should maybe think about writing about that and really think about it before I answer that question. Uh, what is the future of international law over the next 20 years? Well, I think it's an inevitable conclusion, uh, and I know there are members of this faculty as well as my own faculty, Northwestern Law, that will dispute me on this because we have, you know, a kind of a raging debate going on um, about the, the nature and value of international law in our lives. Um, but in my view, I think it's inescapable that international law will, will continue to be and continue to grow as increasingly influential uh, in the lives of nations in the development of domestic law, it will increasingly have to look to the standards being established in international law to understand what is the proper basis for developing further one's own domestic law. Uh, I think it's folly to think that you develop criminal law statutes, security statutes, commercial law statutes, torts issues, uh, in sort of some blind isolation here in the United States without understanding what's happening in all of those areas not only in a comparative sense in foreign societies and in foreign uh, legal systems, but also in the, in the international legal system, the treaties and the customary international law that's being developed. It, it serves your best interest to understand what all those developments are and then to actually be humble enough to recognize that our law can actually benefit from the input that is brought by those international developments. We're not the wisest people all the time. Sometimes other people get it you know, get it first. They, act, they actually figure it out. They actually achieve the protection of certain human rights before we do. It actually happens. And so we can learn from that. And uh, I don't think we should be nervous about that or intimidated by a growing influence of international law. I would rather see, you know, there's a, chap, there's a section in here about the exceptional nation, of obviously the United States being the subject of that topic and how the, the notion of us as the exceptional nation greatly influenced our negotiations for the International Criminal Court, and I explained that uh, in the book. But I also think uh, in terms of the next 20 years, I'd like us to be known as the exceptional nation in the development of the rule of law, in the development of international law. Why not have that uh, uh, identity? 
and not just the exceptional nation in terms of our military might or our values as we try to project them internationally. Yes, in the back. Um, in developing international law, what extent do non-Western states, especially Arab states and African states, have any say in forming uh, what those laws look like? Well, they can have uh, they can have considerable influence if they if they exercise it, um, uh, and that all depends uh, really on their participation in international treaty regimes. If you take the International Criminal Court and the Rome Statute, very, very few Arab states are party to the International Criminal Court. So in fact, they're not in the trenches influencing the development of international criminal justice through the court because they're not, they're not in the room. The only ones that are in the room are Djibouti and Jordan and um, I think that's it. I think Tunisia is moving towards it. Uh, and um, there was talk of Egypt at one point, but that's under the military has now sort of flagged off uh, in Egypt. But um, uh, those states are there, and, and th they are trying to influence the process, but uh, they're, they're largely uh, outside of the room. I'll just give you an anecdote, because my mind keeps floating back to the book to try to answer your question, frankly. Uh, there was a moment in Rome where I was brought in by the head of the working group on sentencing for the statute. Uh, and he said, David, I've got a huge problem. I've got the Arab countries over here, and they all want the death penalty. I mean, they're just rabid for it. You know, the ICC, death penalty central. And, <laughs> and that included the Caribbean as well, by the way. The Caribbeans love the death penalty. So the Caribbeans and the Arabs formed this weird union in Rome. Um, and he said, I've, on the other hand, I've got the Europeans and the Latin Americans, and they hate the death penalty. In fact, they cannot support any court that has the death penalty. It's, it's contrary to European Union law, frankly. Uh, and in Latin America, it's contrary to all religious thinking in Latin America. So there's no way you're going to get the Europeans and the Latin Americans to agree on the ICC having the death penalty. And, I, and yet, I've, I've got a fierce problem here with the Arabs and the Caribbeans. Um, and, oh, by the way, and throw in China as well. So um, can you come in and mediate between these two groups? Because we got to figure out what the sentencing is in the statute. And it was like this, uh, I hate to put it this way, uh, because I work with Sandra Babcock you know, at Northwestern Law, who is just a fantastic death penalty litigator uh, in this country. Um, but uh, of course, this was long before I knew Sandra. But, um, uh, this was kind of a, a, a almost joyful moment for me because here I was having to deal with all of the U.S. interests and equities which everyone was arguing about and complaining about, oh, the U.S. military, what in the world is that all about? So I could put that all aside and just walk into the room and say, let's talk about the death penalty. And I had credibility because the United States loves the death penalty. So I said, we are a nation of the death penalty. Um, and yet, the death, you know, there, this court will not exist if you insist on there being the death penalty. Now, we, the United States, could live with it. If you want to have the death penalty here, we could probably live with that. We're not insisting on it at all. We think this court can achieve its objectives without the death penalty. But here's how you solve the problem, Arab and Caribbean nations. If you, uh, have, if, if you have an individual who uh, falls within the jurisdiction of this court and is being pursued by this court, is being indicted by this court, uh, and you're being uh, asked to transfer this individual to the jurisdiction of the court for trial, where uh, uh, you know, he, will, he will face justice. If you don't want that to happen because you know there'll be no death penalty in The Hague, you prosecute him yourself. That's what the Rome Statute encourages you to do. It's complementarity. It says you do the job yourself we will back off. And uh, so I basically put it to them that if you want to champion the death penalty, pursue justice to do so. Pursue justice in your own courts to do so. Because the Rome Statute invites you to do that. In fact, the Rome Statute invites you to impose the death penalty on that individual. But you have to step up to the plate to do it. You can't use the ICC as a crutch to, to employ the death penalty. 
The crutch is in your hands. It's in your courts. So you get to work. So I made that argument, and uh, it worked. Uh, they finally agreed that the, the ultimate sentence would be life imprisonment. Um, and then we had other various gradations of, of imprisonment categories that we put into the sentencing. So um, it just shows you, uh, if I may, uh, it was a little, a little anecdote to answer your question about you know, where does the Arab, uh, the Arab countries uh, play into this factor. Of course, there's a whole other answer after the Arab Spring, but let's, I, I won't go there right now. Um, yes, uh, and then after you. Uh, yes, sir. Um, what does the indictment of Omar al-Bashir and his subsequent remaining at water say about the authority of the ICC, the actual authority? Right. I think it says a, a tremendous amount of, of, of positive things about the authority of the ICC. Anyone who sits here and thinks that just because the ICC indicts someone, suddenly that person is supposed to appear in that courtroom, particularly if he's a leader of a country, no, that's not going to happen. It's going to take a long time for that to happen. And I would just, uh, uh, you know, my, my response is, yes, I am patient. It could be 10 years. It could be 15 years. You know, when we indicted Slobodan Milosevic in 1999, right in the middle of the Kosovo conflict, everyone was saying, oh, he'll never appear in The Hague. You know, he'll just find sanctuary in Serbia for the rest of his life. It'll never happen. Two years later, it happens. Um, when uh, Charles Taylor was indicted in Liberia, Everyone was saying, oh, well, that he'll never end up, uh, you know, before this special court for Sierra Leone. He'll find some haven. Well, sure enough, haven in Nigeria for him was negotiated. And then we worked hard on the Nigerian government, and Charles Taylor ends up in The Hague before the special court for Sierra Leone. I mean, it can take a strategy. It can take step by step. I, I will tell you this. I can't tell you the details of it, but in November, I ran a, a, a a, a closed-door meeting with the prosecutor at the ICC and his staff about how to develop more intelligent arrest strategies, even for someone like Omar al-Bashir. So uh, that's, that's for internal use at the court. But um, the irony was that the day after that meeting, I was at the airport in Amsterdam, and um, uh, Gaddafi's son is up on the screen, having just been you know, nabbed somewhere in Libya. And, uh, uh, you know, I thought at that point, you know, how does, how does your strategy work out to ensure that now he's in the hands of the militia, how does he actually get to The Hague? And we actually haven't figured that out yet. He's still in the hands of the militia in Libya. He has not been transported to The Hague. It's a very fair question, and it does point to the great difficulties of actually bringing uh, many of these individuals to justice, but many of them do show up in The Hague and are brought to justice. Oh, yes, in the back. Um, yeah, recently I had um, the privilege of um, sitting with a couple of the families in villages near Priador. Um, in, in what country? Priador. Oh, Priador, yeah. yeah. No. And, no, that's um, Bosnia, yeah. And um, right at the same time that Mladic was being turned over by uh -huh. Serbia, so the family talk at the dinner table was really interesting at that time. Yeah. And um, a lot of they, a lot of the families were talking about the Slobo trial failure disaster, and like half of the table really wanted him to go to the Hague, and the other half are like, bring that boy to Bosnia. Like, and, um, you mean to prosecute him to in prosecute Bosnia? To prosecute him yeah. in Bosnia, yeah. like yeah. not wanting another Slobo yeah. trial, trial yeah. failure. Yeah, I, I hear you. And it divided the dinner. It was really interesting, and <laughs> I just wondered your take on sure. the right now, yeah. or just any of your... Well, let me just say, even on the Milosevic trial, everyone, it's so easy for people, of course, even the Bosnians themselves, uh, so many of whom were victims of, of, of the Milosevic strategy for years, um, it's so easy to look at that trial of Slobodan Milosevic in The Hague and say, oh, failure, failure, failure. I mean, after all, he died prior to judgment. Well, I would beg to differ a little bit. Um, there were str uh, tactical strategic mistakes made during the trial, um, but they were also part of the international justice system that it's very difficult to do something, anything about. One being that Milosevic insisted on representing himself in the courtroom. The trial would have been far more efficiently run if he used professional defense counsel to represent him. Once you self-represent yourself in an atrocity crime trial, you are entering a maelstrom of complexity, of long delays, 
And I have argued against uh, freewheeling self-representation in these atrocity trials. They're simply too complex to allow someone to represent himself and not have the assistance of competent defense counsel. Uh, frankly, I think it's almost an insult to the court and to the victims to allow a defendant to manipulate the system through self-representation. That created a tremendous amount of delay in the Milosevic trial. But the second thing I would just say is that Milosevic actually died only months before final judgment. So actually, we were going to get one hell of a mega judgment out of that trial, and, 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 and we missed it by just a few months. So that was a tragedy. Uh, the trial had run its course, and we missed it by just a few months. Um, the, the issue of, of prosecuting uh, Milotic in Bosnia, do you know that actually you could make that argument today? Um, the tribunal obviously wants Milotic. They've indicted him. He's at the top of the pyramid. That's why they exist, is to prosecute the individuals at the top of the leadership pyramid. They're not going to send one of those individuals back to Bosnia for trial because it, it would contradict the very existence of the tribunal to do so. But the Yugoslav tribunal has been um, referring cases back to the war crimes chamber in Bosnia with increasing frequency. And of course, that chamber now has developed a large body of jurisprudence on war crimes. I've always encouraged my own students to take internships with the war crimes chamber in Sarajevo. If you want to look at how war crimes are being prosecuted, go for it. It's happening in Sarajevo. These are the, like the trials uh, uh, that took place in the occupied territories of Germany for years after Nuremberg in military tribunals uh, taking on thousands of cases. That's what's happening in Sarajevo right now. And it's a very, very interesting exercise. It's just that it would be implausible to actually send Milotic back to the war crimes chamber. Uh, it, would, it, it would eviscerate the purpose of the Yugoslav tribunal. Yes. Um, just on more of a purely narrative note, um, can you tell us what it was, what it was like to be encountering and even standing there with some of these people who a lot of people would think are some of the most evil sure. in the moment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it happened uh, uh, frequently. Um, you know, you, you, uh, uh, you're kind of caught up in the immediacy of what you have to achieve in the meeting with that individual. And so your, your emotions, at least for me, you, you kind of compartmentalize them because you know that within a 30 minute period, you need to tell your bosses that you've either achieved or not achieved certain objectives in the discussion with that evil person. So it's not as if you're sitting there thinking, I can't stomach this. Rather, you're kind of nervous saying, I've got a job to do here, I need to to get from point A to, to D, you know, it with that individual. I, I remember sitting in um, Kraina with Albright, and we had uh, Bosnian, uh, uh, we had Bosnian Serbs or Cro uh, you know Serbs and uh, at the table. They they were occupying Croatian territory at that time. Uh, this was before the Dayton Accords, and um, we had in front of us an entire table of these Serbs. Many of them ended up being indicted and and prosecuted, you know. Uh, before the Yugoslav tribunal. And it was, it becomes such a frustrating exercise because there's an enormous amount of op, op excuse me, I need water, obfuscation <laughs> by them in everything that you're dialoguing with them on. In other words, you're not getting clear answers, you're not getting any pathway towards, uh, towards a constructive, you're, you're constantly being told the historical reason why there's a conflict between my ethnic group and this other ethnic group. That's the entire dialogue. And by the way, let me remind you, 400 years ago, X. 300 years ago, Y. Now, I'm here today. I represent the history of my people. And this just goes on and on. Meanwhile, you know that they have been responsible for real-time atrocities. Uh, one, of the, one of the key issues, though, is do you sit down with somebody after they've been indicted uh, by the Yugoslav tribunal in this case, or by any war crimes tribunal. And uh, we had a policy, Albright and me, uh, at least in our realm, of not doing so. 
there were certain U.S. officials who, you know, were instructed to, uh, to uh, uh, sometimes interact with these people, if only indirectly, in order to, to deal with a particular problem. There was the fate of Richard Holbrook, who just prior to Dayton in 1995, he travels to Belgrade to sit down with Milosevic, who was not indicted at that point, and Karadzic and Miladic walk into the room. <laughs> They're indicted, and they walk into the room in Belgrade. And so Holbrook, he has to kind of deal with these people thrust at him. He has no authority to go out there and meet individually with Karadzic and Miladic because they're indicted. But that was thrust upon him. So that's sort of an understandable, you know, dilemma uh, that can be confronted by an official. Um, I'm trying to think of, uh, your question is actually so good, I'm trying to think of a better example of where this happened. Oh, well, it's not in the book. <laughs> Um, but there is an example where I was in the Congo, Democratic this Republic. Part yeah, this, this, I was in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in the, uh, uh, the Kivu area. Um, this book does not cover all that I did in the Congo, Sudan, uh, Burundi. Um, it just, uh, you just couldn't get in. Uh, so there's, I, I had to delete 60,000 words from this book to publish it. So that's some other day. But, um, I do, I do remember, you know, sitting down with an absolute atrocity lord in Congo, in his home. Uh, I was, I, I had no security with me. Uh, I went with one other State Department official who was as rogue as I was. Uh, we had no instructions from Washington to go down any particular road to get to this guy, but we did. And we got there, we sat down, uh, his militiamen, you know, stood behind us, all doors were locked. And I was there to talk to him about what in the world is his militia doing to uh, certain, certain populations in, in the Kivu. And of course I was trying as war crimes ambassador to encourage him to cease these activities. Uh, and I really got uh, very tough with him. I said, we're watching you. You will be the object of prosecution. I know exactly who you are, and I know through intelligence what you're doing, and I want you to take this seriously. You, have, you still have the opportunity to turn back from this kind of conduct. Uh, you have no idea what was going on inside of me when I said that. <laughs> I mean, I had no idea if I was getting out of that door, and frankly, Washington didn't know squat that I was in that room. Okay, so it was a very risky moment. And um, uh, there was another moment in Sudan where, again, I went down, I drove a whole day to get to a rebel camp in southern Sudan to deliver the same message to a warlord in Sudan. And uh, I, had, I didn't have anyone from the U.S. with me. I only had um, uh, UN UNICEF people with me uh, because they had the vehicle. And so I, I drove in a UNICEF vehicle way into the outback of Sudan, sat down under this huge tree with this uh, warlord, and uh, we talked about you know, what was happening in the field uh, with various atrocities. And uh, I sort of delivered the same message to him. And you, know, you don't know when you're doing that uh, whether that vehicle is gonna be able to take you back down that long road for a day and get you out of there. <laughs> Um, but you do some of those things because you're an idiot, but you just do it, you know. Um, and uh, uh, so that's kind of, you know, they don't have to be indicted for you to know that they're involved in, in these kinds of activities and, and um, uh, try to push, push back on them, you know. Okay. I think we can uh, thank Ambassador Sheffer. I want to make thank you. The World Beyond the Headlines Lecture Series is a project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies. Our nationally recognized programming is made possible with support from the Norman Waite Harris Memorial Fund. Download recordings of other events and learn more about the World Beyond the Headlines series at the Center for International Studies website, cis.uchicago.edu.